This is a legal update about the new Senate Bill 23, uh, excuse me, 1235, the new regulations on ammunition. Uh, this seminar, this webinar has been produced by the California Rifle and Pistol Association, the National Rifle Association, and Gun Owners of California. Uh, forgive me, but you're getting a free webinar. You're going to have to bear with us while we put on a couple of advertisements. Let me first say I'm Chuck Michelle, even though I'm under Emily Lay as the presenter on, the, on your screen. I'm the senior partner at Michelle and Associates. We do a lot of work for. Uh, I've been my actually my my pleasure and privilege to represent the NRA and the CRPA in California for the last 20 years on on a variety of different issues. Uh, speaking with me today will be Joseph Silvoso, my regulatory compliance counsel at Michelle and Associates. He's sort of the specialist on these uh, on these new laws. Uh, there, we initially started to put these. Uh, uh, to summarize these laws uh, in, a, in a, a narrative form, in a, in a legal memorandum, uh, that quickly got out of hand. It's now 66 pages long, so we are uh, we've kind of condensed things and put it into this webinar format, which we're getting a much more uh, favorable response to. So I appreciate everybody coming on board today to listen. We have about 700 people listening in right now, uh, and uh, another 500 or so that had registered, and will no doubt go online to see it afterwards uh, on the recorded version on the CRPA's website. Uh, because we do have this 66-page uh, memorandum available, uh, we're going to roll that into the fourth edition of the book that Joe and I have written called California Gun, Line, Gun Law is a Guide to State and, Local, uh, State and Federal Firearms Regulations. Uh, if you pre-order that from CRPA, we'll send you the 66-page summary. Or not really a summary; it's a, a fairly detailed analysis of what these, all of these new laws do. Um, and uh, then, when the book comes out, you get, you get the summary. You get the uh, the 66-page memo now, and then you get the book uh, when it comes out in Thanksgiving, uh, around Thanksgiving, uh, hopefully in the beginning of November. Anyway, uh, so. That, I think, covers a lot of the basics that may or may not be covered as we cover some of the stuff here. Uh, this is my law firm. These are the people that, that work for the NRA and CRPA every day. Uh, keep in mind, if you use legal services and you are using one of these big firms that does pro bono work for the gun ban lobby, uh, your corporate work may be uh, subsidizing some of the work that actually goes against our, uh, our interests in the right to keep and bear arms. There's a group called the Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence up in San Francisco, which is essentially the law firm for the gun ban lobby that uh, gets a lot of free work from some of those other law firms. So you should ask what law firm, whatever law firm you may or your friends may be using, uh, whether or not they work, they do pro bono work for the gun ban lobby. Um, uh, so if, you, if someone has legal work for us, we do uh, lots of firearms related work, but we also do environmental, land use, uh, general civil rights, labor and employment. So please let us know if we can help you out. We do offer free consultations. So the, I also want folks to know what the CRPA is. On our last uh, call, lots of people hadn't heard of the CRPA. CRPA is the California Rifle and Pistol Association. It's the official state association of the NRA. And uh, CRPA and NRA work together in California. If you can only afford to join one, you should definitely be, everybody should be to join the NRA first. But uh, by joining both, you sort of leverage your money. It's sort of a uh, they're, they're working together. They're more effective than either one of those groups would be individually. Both CRPA and NRA have lobbyists in Sacramento uh, who, depending on how the deck is stacked against them up there, uh, uh, are more or less successful. Uh, some of the things that have happened to, to us lately would have happened to us a long time ago were it not for uh, the efforts of those folks, including, by the way, uh, Sam Paredes of Gun Owners of California. He's up there as a full-time lobbyist too. The NRA has three staff from the Executive Vice President's Office of Wayne LaPierre working in California full-time, and one person from the Institute for Legislative Action uh, along with all their grassroots volunteers and my law firm doing work for the NRA. So in our last call, we got a lot of questions bet uh, from folks about the structure of the gun uh, rights lobbies, the gun rights associations in California. Uh, hopefully this uh, kind of fills you guys in on that. These are the things that, that the NRA and the CRPA do together in California. So the legislative advocacy is our lobbyists up in Sacramento, local ordinance and monitoring and opposition. There are a lot of efforts to pass local ordinances that, that uh, are, are 
bad for gun owners. Uh, if you hear of those, please, please bring them to our attention because we uh, routinely fight back against those. One of the things that we're facing right now is an effort to shut down the Del Mar Gun Show down in Orange County. So we'll be sending out some information about that uh, to, to, to rally everybody to oppose that, and we'll also be telling them that what they're trying to do is not legal. Hunting regulations and petitions, there's a move to ban hunting in California completely. The Humane Society of the United States is spearheading, spearheading that effort. They want to reintroduce grizzly bears, coyotes, mountain lions, and other predators so that the deer and elk and any other game population gets so low that hunting is not sustainable. Uh, Firearms regulations, DOJ watchdog, the DOJ Firearms Bureau passes regulations that, that affect gun owners just like the um, Del Mar is in San Diego County. Good point, someone. Thank you there. Um, uh, the DOJ is constantly under the leadership of Kamala Harris trying to come up with ways to pass regulations or policies that make it more difficult for folks to, to get a gun uh, or use a gun. Uh, so we're constantly pushing back against that, monitoring what they're doing. Of course, NRA and CRPA both put on shooting programs and training programs and coordinate grassroots volunteers and NRA members councils throughout the state. So if you want to uh, uh, try and help out with any of those things, first thing to do is to register to vote. Uh, if we, there's between 8 and 12 million gun owners in California. <clears throat> if they would all, if, if, a, if a half a million of them would register to vote, we would take this state back. So uh, please make sure you're registered and get your friends to register so that we can uh, have a difference in some of these elections coming up. Uh, this is how to contact CRPA. You can volunteer at volunteer.crpa.org. You can contact them that way, or you can submit an article to the firing line uh, at that email address. Again, you'll be able to watch this afterwards. It will be recorded if you want to get these uh, email addresses later. Uh, and also go to crpa.org forward slash California Connections and get plugged into our Facebook pages and um, Twitter and Instagram and, and uh, into the Google Twitter face is what uh, the conglomeration of uh, social media outlets seems to have come into. Um, and you can also be, keep posted on all the things that are happening in Sacramento by signing up to the, either the CRA, CRPA uh, alerts or the NRA Institute for Legislative Action alerts at their website. So crpa.org, sign up and get, uh, get, stay informed, get postings on all the legislation that's pending. I will say a quick word about uh, Veto Gun Mageddon, which uh, some folks are asking in the, in the chat room here. Uh, we, we're out there every weekend trying to get signatures on the petitions that would, re, that would veto these bills. And, uh, and so please get out there and do sign those. They're at multiple locations throughout the state. Uh, CRPA and NRA both have those at all their events, but gun stores across the state have them as well. Um, uh, but keep in mind, no matter what happens with that signature gathering initiative or with the veto referendums, uh, it's, that is one battle in a long war. We need everybody engaged uh, to, uh, to help us fight that, that fight. Uh, so if we get more gun owners engaged, if gun owners uh, actually uh, participate in the process, we can take back this state, we can protect our, our right to keep and bear arms, and uh, I'd ask all of you to help us out with that. Upcoming, our next webinar will be uh, August 31st on the last portion of the new bills, the theft and reporting requirement and the large capacity, so-called large capacity, they're actually standard capacity magazine possession ban that uh, has also been passed. So please mark your calendars, and, and by all means, uh, listen in on that one too. So I think we're first uh, going to take a poll here, and then we will get into uh, the substance of the presentation. So our first poll is, are you willing to help a pro-gun candidate run for political office? I see that a lot of people are, and that's very encouraging. Uh, the best way to do that again, is send your contact information to volunteer at crpa.org. We are working with the grassroots uh, folks at NRA headquarters and also the NRA members councils to, uh, to put volunteers to good use. We have lots of things that volunteers can do, plenty of different uh, things with different interests. So uh, you'll find something that you'll actually in 
enjoy doing if you're willing. Here's poll question number two. Uh, that is very, very encouraging. I can't tell you how, how encouraging it is to see folks being willing to volunteer. We've NRA and CRPA have spent a lot of time trying to get uh, gun owners engaged. And uh, thanks, I think, in large part to social media and some of the new communications technologies, not the least of which is webinars, uh, we're really getting the word out to a lot more people these days, and we're getting a lot more people uh, uh, engaged and interested. So please be part of that. We can use all the, all the help we can get. Uh, so with that, I think I'm going to turn this over to, to Joe Silvoso to talk about the, the, what the new bill on ammunition would do and also what the Newsom Initiative, uh, if it if it uh, passes, would do. Joe? Okay. Hey, everybody. Um, good to talk to you again if you participated last week. Thanks for coming back. Those of you who missed the presentation from last week, um, it has been recorded. Um, but nevertheless, um, thank you for the newcomers who are coming by. We have basically the same uh, or similar amount of people that we had last time uh, for the Sullivan's. Uh, I did to handle a couple of um, housekeeping issues. I've already seen a number of questions kind of scroll on by um, in the chat box. Uh, like Chuck mentioned, we will try to tr address a number of those um, at, at, while this is going on or at the end of this. However, there will probably be far too many questions for us to address here. Nevertheless, keep on asking them because similar to the assault weapon presentation, uh, we will be um, compiling those uh, and, and putting together a list of most frequently asked questions. There were so many questions for the assault weapon uh, lecture last time. We're still kind of putting all that stuff together. And on top of that, CRPA still keeps on getting uh, questions addressed directly to it. Um, but nevertheless, keep on submitting those questions um, to uh, CRPA or in the chat box, and we'll keep the chat box open once I'm done here for you to keep on providing questions after I've spoken here for the next, let's see, about 30, 45 minutes or so um, on these issues. Uh, so bear, keep that in mind that we might and probably won't be able to get all of your questions answered. Um, I have seen a number that we will be addressing anyway, so I hope that those will be addressed uh, for most of you anyway. Um, but like Chuck said, we'll be talking about the recently enacted ammunition bill and talking briefly on how that is cross-referenced or affected by um, the Newsom Initiative Prop 63 um, and how um, those things intersect and may be changed, especially this bill may be changed with the passing of that initiative. If it does pass and if it doesn't pass, what the law will be at least on the books right now. Um, but like I mentioned last week, um, and I'll mention it again, and I'll mention it again uh, next week, um, a little bit of a legal disclaimer. Uh, we are not covering the full scope of these laws. I couldn't do that in the amount of time that we have. If I had two hours, I probably wouldn't be able to cover the full scope of just the ammunition stuff alone. So bear in mind that we are watering down this stuff to a certain extent so it's presentable. Um, and digestible. Um, the best places to get those laws would, of course, be the law itself. Um, if you, like Chuck mentioned, pre-order um, California gun laws through CRPA, you'll get a copy of the, for lack of a better word, treaties that we put together on these new laws. And then, of course, these new laws will be incorporated into the fourth edition of California gun laws and we'll be going into this stuff in minute detail. But for purposes of this presentation, especially a lot of the exceptions to the requirements, I even will say in the slides that I'm not covering or fully explaining all of the exceptions, because if I were to do that, we'd probably just have a three-page list of a bunch of people who are going to be exempt from certain of, or some of these requirements. So keep that in mind as well. Also, um, our friends up in Sacramento still can change things potentially. Um, it would be somewhat doubtful this session that they'd be able to get something in, but heck, they suspended rules once this session already to shove a bunch of gun laws down our throats. Um, it wouldn't be unheard of for purposes of this year, but nevertheless, it's probably unlikely. Also, even though I'm going to be talking about the laws um, as they have been um, signed by the governor and will go into effect, at least go onto the books of January 1st of next year, um, they are subject to change or further clarification by the California Department of Justice 
in putting together the rules and requirements for all of these processes I'll be talking about. And then, of course, nothing prevents our friends in Sacramento from changing their minds about these laws. Uh, next session, and then last but not least, and especially for purposes of this lecture, we also have the Newsom Initiative that could change. And like I said before, I'll be addressing some of those changes, most certainly not all of them. And I most certainly will be not going into minute detail about the Newsom Initiative. We may be doing a webinar um, as we get close to voting time on the full implementation or full applications of the Newsom Initiative so people know what they need to be voting against in November. Um, but that would happen sometime in the next couple of months. So just so hold on one second right there. Uh, uh, folks should go to the Coalition for Civil Liberties web page and Facebook page uh, on the new, for information on the Newsom Initiative. That uh, Cal California's campaign finance laws uh, don't allow NRA or CRPA or GOC to to uh, basically campaign directly against Newsom. You have to form a PAC, and so they've all come together under that PAC. It's at StopTheAmmoGrab.com or at Coalition for Civil Liberties Facebook page. You get a lot more information about. Uh, what the Newsom Initiative would do and how you can push back against it. I also see that there are some people having issues with sound. Uh, we have uh, sound through the speakers of your computer, but also you can, if you're not, if you can't get that to work, and double check and make sure your mute isn't on and isn't off and is, is off, and your uh, uh, speakers are turned up. But if that doesn't work, there are a limited number of call-in lines that you can hear the video, or excuse me, hear the audio. Uh, directly on your phone. So, uh, uh, Ben, is that number posted here? No, but I will post it in the chat. Um, okay, so code. watch the chat, and you'll see there's only room for 150 people to call in. So, if you're getting the sound over your uh, through your computer, just stick with that. But if some of you are still having problems, you can. Uh, uh, we have room for 150 people to call in on the phone line. Okay, with that, I'll turn it back to Joe. Okay, thanks. Um, and. I guess that about it covers it for the legal disclaimers and at least for the beginning part about Newsom until – oh, wait, there's more. Um, Senator de Leon was clever, uh, in other words, devious, in how he finally put together um, SB 1235, and it's laid out on this slide. If the Newsom initiative is enacted, sections 12, 15, and 16, and I'll discuss each one of those individually a bit later, um, will become effective. And the other sections of uh, the bill, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 13, and 14, will not. So in other words, the vast majority of the bill that was passed will be California law if the Newsom, Newsom initiative is defeated. If it, it passes uh, and is voted by uh, the citizens of California in November into law, then only those sections 12, 15, and 16 will come into effect. And, so, and, and don't worry about which sections those are. I'll be talking about those briefly here and moving forward and what the requirements of each will be. Um, but just keep that in mind, and I'll address those each as they come. Also for purposes of this lecture, um, I, the ammunition bill it was, is rather broad in scope. It, it adds an, an, and uh, requires firearm uh, dealers, and, more specific, and probably better put, uh, ammunition vendors to do a great number of things. Since the vast majority of people here, I'm assuming, are regular old California citizens um, and not employees or um, potential vendors, I'm not going to be going into specifics about those. I actually have already done that through AccuSport. Um, AccuSport members were able to get a longer version of all of these lectures um, that included that information. So if you're an AccuSport member, you can go ahead and access that lecture specific to vendors. But for purposes of this um, lecture, I'm going to be touching more on the issues and concerns for the regular Californians and not getting into great deal detail with respect to the requirements of ammunition vendors in the state. And, and you'll notice in the top slide, and I do this pretty much for all the other slides, I'll reference if Newsom doesn't pass what the law will be, and if Newsom passes what the law will be. Um, and so just keep that in mind in the top portion of the slide. But for purposes of these new laws, when I'm talking about ammunition, 
I'm talking about the definition that is appearing on the screen in front of you. Specifically, it's a complete cartridge. And so when we're talking about the restrictions on ammunition sales or the importation of ammunition or the requirement for face-to-face -face transfers of ammunition, I'm talking about the full cartridge. California law defines ammunition a couple of different ways, and one of those ways would include the components and even including the clips, magazines, and speed loaders. Um, all of that would fall under ammunition for purposes and pretty much only for the purposes of prohibited persons in possession of ammunition. So I'm not really overly concerned about that here because this law doesn't address that. So when I'm talking about ammunition today, I'm talking about the specific definition that's appearing in front of you, and we're talking about a fully assembled cartridge. So components, and I saw some questions in the chat room relating to um, reloading and what's going to happen with the powder and the casings and the projectiles. All of that stuff, if it's not a complete cartridge, is not covered under the initiative. And so, so for purposes of doing a background check, if you're just buying primers, that in itself will not be considered quote unquote ammunition for these laws and these restrictions I'm about ready to discuss. Also, the law adds a new violation. Under California law, it is illegal for you to purchase ammunition for somebody else uh, when the transfer knows that or has caused to believe that the person purchasing the ammunition is doing it for somebody who's prohibited. So if a dealer or someone selling ammunition is selling it to somebody and they know that person purchasing the ammunition is doing so on behalf of a prohibited person, uh, that would be illegal for them to sell the ammunition, much like your standard straw sale uh, for firearms. Um, that would apply in this in instance as well. Vendor's licenses. For most intents and purposes, and I'll touch on some of these exceptions here in a second, but nevertheless for most and almost all intents and purposes, in order to sell ammunition, you will need a vendor's license. And when I say vendor or ammunition vendor, that phrase and that term, it will be interchangeable for me um, while I'm talking about this lecture. And actually, it's interchangeable within the code. And so when you're reading these laws for yourself, you'll see references to a vendor, and then you'll see references to ammunition vendor. Essentially, it's the same thing, and they define them the same way. Um, the, the license does not extend, again, to the reloading requirement and doesn't extend to the importation requirement. However, there will be restrictions on California residents importing ammunition they purchase outside of the state, um, and that will be discussed later. And one of those requirements will be if you want to purchase that ammunition, it will have to be sent to a vendor in order to have that ammunition transferred to you, uh, barring a limited exception. Uh, the license to sell ammunition will be required on January 1st, 2018. So like I mentioned once before, all of these laws will, in a sense, go on the books January 1st, 2017, basically January 1 next year. But they won't come into effect until later on. And so the requirement that you have a license to sell ammunition, that won't be a requirement until January 1st, 2018, partly because uh, the people who want to and need to get the license will need a time to apply for and acquire that license uh, prior to that requirement going live. And people will start be able to acquire and apply for the license as of July 1st, 2017. And of course, if you want to um, sell ammunition in the state of California, unless you fall under an exception to the license requirement, you're going to need to get that license prior to January 1st, 2018. And some of, the, the, some of the individuals or entities that don't need and will not need a vendor's licenses, we're talking here, and again, I am being very broad on this. There are very specific requirements for a lot of these exceptions I'm laying out here. My strong advice would be if you think you fall under one of these exceptions here, confirm it with the code section itself, maybe pre-order. Um, a copy of the California Gun Laws book to see the analysis that our office provides concerning these exceptions, and or potentially talk to a lawyer who knows California gun law um, to discuss further whether or not you fall under any of these exceptions. But some of the exceptions that would apply to the requirement of having a vendor's license to sell 
ammunition would include your commercial hunting clubs, domestic game bird clubs, um, nonprofits, certain nonprofits that are engaged in the recreational shooting or lawful hunting activities, your target facilities. Target facilities specifically phrased in the code section, but nevertheless, most of your ranges would not necessarily need a vendor's license, and as I'll discuss later on, will not need um, to conduct background checks and or take purchaser information. However, you'll notice the number of these exceptions or uh, these groups that are accepted have an asterisk next to them. Look down at the bottom of the screen. Uh, for almost all of these exceptions that have the asterisks, they're going to need to and require the ammunition to be used on and exclusively on site and typically in association with the activities that that organization does. And so for the commercial hunting clubs, you're going to have to use it on the club's facilities specifically for purposes of hunting and nothing else. And so you couldn't use it for potentially target practice, and you most certainly could not use it or purchase the ammunition and then take it off site. The club would get in trouble with that because then they would be selling ammunition without a vendor's license in that situation. Um, there are a couple of other um, limited exceptions for persons who sell no more than 100 rounds uh, within a month and no more than 25, or, I'm sorry, 250 rounds uh, in a calendar year. And then there are restrictions on selling 50 rounds, uh, but that's pretty limited to immediate family members and license, between licensed hunters who are both engaged in the act of hunting. So just bear that in mind. A lot of the exceptions, certainly a lot of the exceptions I'm going to be talking about here later on with respect to the background checks and the um, purchaser information acquisition requirements, um, they're going to be allowed for a number of these clubs and most certainly target range or licensed target ranges, I should say, but it, they're almost ex universally going to require that ammunition to be acquired and then used at the facility, and that's it. The ammunition will not be able to be removed from the premises. Um, access to ammunition in your local stores. Uh, vendors will not be able to have employees who they know or reasonably know are prohibited um, from possessing, uh, it says it's their ammunition, but for all intents and purposes, it's firearms and ammunition. If a person is prohibited from owning and possessing firearms under California and federal law, they are typically, oh, well, they are, um, likewise prohibited from owning and possessing ammunition. And so in that situation, a vendor can have an employee they know who is prohibited to have custody control over the ammunition. And then for um, us purchasers in the state of California, it's going to be kind of like the razor blade situation in your local supermarket. And they have that case where you can't access it without the employee getting the key and giving you access to the razor blades in order for you to buy a razor blades. Uh, your firearm dealers, and more accurately put, your ammunition vendors, um, can only display ammunition that in a way that allows or prevents the purchaser from having access to it without a vendor or employee assistance. And so a lot of your gun stores uh, will have uh, the ammunition or have to put the ammunition either behind the counter or uh, in a lot of cases in a lot of the stores I've been into, that's not even practical because, well, heck, they have the firearm behind the counter. They don't got room for the ammunition, so they're going to have to come up with a way to prevent access to the ammunition by uh, members of the public when you come into their stores. It's going to be a huge pain for the vendors to either remodel or redo their stores for purposes of these requirements. Um, starting July 1st, um, 2019, you're going to need to get a background check in order to be able to purchase ammunition. For most people, this background check is going to cost $1, um, but that will be contingent on you having, oops, I, I backed up, oh no, I did not, I'm sorry. Actually, I'm going to move forward half a second because that's basically how they're going to do the background check on that slide. That's going to be contingent on you having a firearm registered to you in the automated firearm system and you not appearing in the armed prohibited persons file. And basically how this is going to work is that when you go in on July 1st, uh, 2019, to purchase your ammunition, they're going to run your name through a California Department of Justice automated system. And what that system is going to do, in theory at least, will be automatically check one to see if you have any firearms registered to you. 
If you do, fantastic. Then it will double check to make sure you're not in the ARM prohibited persons file or, or ARM prohibited persons system. And so the ARM prohibited persons system is a list of people who have registered firearms and are prohibited from owning and possessing firearms. So you, a lawful firearm owner, and for someone who wants to purchase ammunition, should not appear in the ARM prohibited persons file. And so they'll confirm you have a firearm registered to you, and then as a result, confirm that you aren't in the ARM prohibited person file, and then at that point, proceed with the firearm transaction. For those of you who don't have firearms registered to you, and that most certainly would probably include anybody who's visiting from outside the state of California who's never purchased a firearm in the state of California and had that firearm registered at the time of purchase uh, to them um, in the automated firearm system. And yes, uh, I do know about the, the times relating to when firearms are registered in the system and long guns specifically, but I'm not going to get into detail about that. But nevertheless, a lot of people coming into California from outside the state who want to purchase ammunition here will most certainly not have firearms registered to them, and most certainly some first-time shooters um, or people who um, are family, have family members who have firearms and then typically will use those firearms when they go to the range. Um, they may not have firearms registered to them. There will be a separate application if they don't have any firearms I'm sorry, yes, firearms registered to them in the automated firearm system wherein they can do a single ammunition transaction. Unfortunately for them, the cost for that, which will be established by the California Department of Justice, but the code spe specifies that that cost cannot exceed the current DROS or dealer record of sale fee of $19. So those unfortunate individuals, well, maybe fortunate individuals, depending on who you are, who don't have any firearms registered to them in the automated firearm system will have to go through this process versus everybody else who, if they have a firearm registered to them in the system and are not in the armed prohibited person uh, database, they would just need to pay the $1 fee for the automatic background check. Again, all of this stuff will be required and if a dealer does not have confirmation and if the dealer cannot get confirmation from the California Department of Justice that the person is eligible to possess the ammo or acquire the ammunition, they will be prohibited from transferring the ammunition. So if DOJ, who has well, a horrible uh, track record in implementing uh, computer systems and programs, uh, if they can't get this to work where it's instantaneous, you may be twiddling your thumbs at the gun counter for quite some time while the system coughs and wheezes and eventually prints out whether or not you're eligible to acquire that ammunition. I hope they get the system up and running, first of all, when it's required to be up and running and working correctly at that time, but this will remain to be seen. And again, DOJ doesn't have the greatest of track records in implementing these things um, and having them work perfectly on day one. Um, exceptions to the background check requirements. Um, I, like I mentioned before, there's going to be a whole slew of these. Uh, as it says at the bottom, this is most certainly not a comprehensive list, um, but as a summary, you still have your California licensed firearm dealers, wholesalers and gunsmiths, uh, those on the exempt list from FFLs, um, uh, federal firearms uh, licensed manufacturers or importers of firearms and ammunition, uh, somebody who is an ammunition vendor themselves, um, CNR collectors with COEs, um, and I should clarify, CNR um, stands for Curio or Relic Collectors, and I just said COEs, but it's written out there for you. Certificate of Eligibility Possessors, so if you have a CNR collector's license and a COE, you're going to be exempt from the background check requirement. Um, hunting and target facilities, as it says right there, and then the person on those facilities while engaged in those activities, specifically hunting and target shooting, and the ammunition is consumed on those facilities. A lot of the exceptions that I mentioned are already concerning the sales or the vendor's license, um, and as it extends to those uh, clubs and target facilities selling the ammunition to its members or the participants at the range, they're going to be exempt from pretty much all of these requirements. However, they're also going to require that the ammunition be acquired and used at that facility only. What happens with extra ammunition and all the other stuff kind of remains to be seen, but that ammunition is going to have to stay there and be used there 
um, or the vendor or is going to have themselves a, a substantial problem. In addition to the background check, you, the purchaser of ammunition, will need to provide the California Department of Justice a whole bunch of information um, through the vendor. Basically, I mean, we're assuming it's going to be very similar to the DROST process, the dealer record of sale process that you go through when purchasing um, firearms. But of course, uh, this remains to be seen how they're going to put it together and implement it because the regulations um, associated with this process uh, have yet to be put together. And most certainly, the computer system that all of this stuff is going to run through um, has yet to be probably written or even dreamed up yet. Um, up north in Sacramento. But nevertheless, on July 1, 2019, all of the following information is going to need to be provided to the vendor who will then electronically be providing that to the California Department of Justice. Um, and for those of you who might have jumped in late, I see a couple of hands raised. I'm not going to be able to address those while we're doing this. Please feel free to add and put questions into the chat box. We will try to address some of those towards the end of this. And if not, like I said before, uh, CRPA will be compiling those. We'll be putting a list of the most frequently asked ones together and providing those answers. I would hope it would be in the next uh, week or so. Um, but like I mentioned before, the assault weapon one is taking us a long time to call through. Um, so give us a couple of weeks, but we will try to address those questions um, as quickly as possible. Uh, but turning back to the purchaser information, like I said, that information is going to be electronically submitted to DOJ. Um, the vendors are going to be prohibited from sharing that information with the exception of law enforcement. Um, and DOJ will hold your information, uh, much like they do for the automated firearm system. However, while the automated firearm system information sticks around for years and years and years, uh, the, the ammunition purchaser information under the bill uh, will last and stay with DOJ for two years. And again, for the exceptions, a lot of the same people we talked about before for the purchaser information are there as well. You got your dealers, wholesalers, and gunsmiths, exempt lists, um, federally firearms, or I'm sorry, federally licensed firearm manufacturers and importers, um, ammunition vendors. You've got the clubs I mentioned before in the target facilities and those who acquire the firearms, I'm sorry, the ammunition at those facilities. Um, I did not touch before uh, concerning the background check, um, but they most certainly will be exempt from that as well. Um, but I'll mention them here too, is the um, representatives of law enforcement agency and properly identified sworn law enforcement officers. And so if they have proper identification, and for purposes of this requirement, I'm assuming that's going to just require them to have some type of law enforcement ID. Um, they're going to be exempt from both the background check and the purchaser information. And like I said, I didn't mention it, and I probably should have, for the background check requirement for law enforcement officers or representatives of law enforcement agencies uh, when acquiring ammunition, their background check and purchaser information will not be required to be done or taken. Face-to-face -face transfers. There is no date, which is why I say presumably on the top of this slide that it's to go into effect on July 1, 2019. Um, but I'm pretty sure that is going to be the solid date because in order to complete a face-to-face -face, uh, transfer, or more accurately put, meet the face-to-face -face transfer requirement, a vendor will need to go through the background check and the personal information process. And like I mentioned before, those processes will not go into effect until July 1, 2019. So presumably, this process will go into effect at the same time because the vendor will not be able to comply with the background check and the personal information requirement until that date. So I'm pretty solid that that date for the face-to-face -face transfers is going to be July 1, 2019. But nevertheless, that face-to-face -face transfer requirement is going to involve the sale, delivery, or, and or transfer of ammunition is going to require um, it to be done face-to-face. -face. And so ammunition acquired from out of state, i.e. over the Internet, will need to, much like firearms, unfortunately, in the state of California, that's a federal requirement and a state one now, um, will need to be shipped, shipped, <laughs> shipped to um, an ammunition vendor. And then that vendor will, much like your transfer of firearms nowadays, um, process the transfer for you. The vendor can charge you um, up to $10 for that. Um, if you're having the ammunition shipped to the vendor, 
Uh, make sure you pick that stuff up as soon as possible because the vendor is only required to keep it for up to 30 days. But nevertheless, uh, if you're going to acquire ammunition from outside of the state and have it shipped to you, um, I know I prefer doing that in a lot of cases and just having it show up on my doorstep and or at the office. Um, after July 1st, 2019, I'll have to have it shipped to a vendor, and then that vendor will then need to do the background check. I need to provide my personal information, probably pay that vendor a 10 buck fee in addition to what I paid for the ammunition in order for me to get and have that ammunition transferred to me. And again, much like the exceptions I mentioned once before, you see kind of the same ones rear their heads again. Again, this is not a full list, but you have uh, your California licensed firearm dealers, wholesalers, ammunition vendors, of course, can have the ammunition shipped directly to them, uh, licensed DNR collectors with COEs, um, your representatives of law enforcement, the properly identified uh, sworn law enforcement officers, and of course the clubs and the target facilities I've mentioned before, uh, they can have that ammunition shipped directly to them um, without, have it, without the face-to-face -face requirement or having to go through an ammunition vendor for purposes of this transaction. Um, and then on top of that, um, much like the restriction on private party sales, of firearms, there's going to be a restriction on private sales of ammunition. So when neither party um, has a vendor's license and two individuals want to sell ammunition between themselves, they'll need to take that ammunition down to a vendor, and the vendor will need to then process the ammunition sale uh, for them. Of course, charge a fee with respect to that, um, and then go ahead and proceed through here. Keep in mind, and I've mentioned it a couple times before, when it comes to the vendor's license to sell ammunition and this private sales of ammunition, there's a reason why I'm emphasizing sales, because there is no restriction if two private individuals inside the state of California want to give each other ammunition unless the person receiving the ammunition is prohibited from owning and possessing it. And so in other words, if I wanted to give someone else ammunition, I may. The face-to-face -face requirements will still apply because that involves transfers in, additions, in addition to sale. But the law has been very specific on when a vendor's license is required, and it's required for purposes of sales. And this private party transfer requirement is very specific as, as well. It says specifically that if two individuals want to sell each other ammunition, they'll need to take it to a vendor. There appears to be no restriction on the giving of ammunition under these laws with, res with respect uh, or with exception to the face-to-face -face requirement. So as long as I'm face-to-face -face with that person, I can still give them the ammunition in the state of California. But of course, I want to be sure, or at least know, or be reasonably aware that the person I'm giving that ammunition to is not prohibited from owning and possessing firearms and ammunition. So if I wanted to give ammunition to a friend of mine, if I wanted to give ammunition to my wife, I may do so without falling under these restrictions on the vendor license, the background check, the uh, personal information, and the private party sales restrictions. Uh, with no problems. Again, I will need to be face-to-face -to, -face to do that, but that's about it for purposes of those transfers. And I think we've got another poll. And so if you want to go ahead and chime in on that, um, are you willing to volunteer to help programming candidates uh, run for political, that's probably supposed to be political office, um, but we'll call them a political officer for right now as well. Um, go ahead and, and poll those up. And uh, we had a lot of volunteers out there. Um, that's awesome because time is a very valuable thing, and, have, and, and you're putting it most certainly towards a good cause for a pro-gun candidate. Um, again, I see a number of hands raised. Again, please put those questions in the chat box. I'm not going to be able to address that raised hand uh, for purposes of this. And again, we'll try to address those um, towards the end here as well as we can. And I think there's another poll question. Uh, which method do you prefer to use when contributing contributing to a pro-Second Amendment group, 
Um, you got online, mail, uh, speak to the person on the phone or other method. Please um, choose one of those. And we're still getting some responses to that. Um, there's a question, does the maximum of 50 apply for giving ammunition? No, it's sales specific. Um, and so be very mindful of that. Of course, you're going to have to be looking that person in the eye, do the face-to-face -face giving, but it's specific to sales. Um, and the giving um, is not covered under that requirement. Again, sales is used repeatedly um, and specifically in the code. Uh, moving on. Uh, ban on the importation by a resident, um, much like the restrictions or the requirements for background checks and um, for personal purchaser information. This goes into effect July 1, 2019. It's going to prohibit residents of the state of California from going outside of the state, purchasing ammunition, and then bringing it back in with them. It does not prevent you from purchasing ammunition in the state, taking it out of the state, and then bringing it back in. Although if you were to go about that process, I'd probably suggest you carry that receipt with you just to make sure you don't have any problems uh, with law enforcement. If they were to pull you over on the Arizona-California border and they find a bunch of ammunition in your car, you can say, well, heck, I have purchased this here. Here's my receipt. Um, I didn't get a chance to shoot it at the range because, I don't know, my dog got sick and I had to go home. Um, but nevertheless, you can't purchase ammunition outside the state of California without sending it into uh, that vendor I mentioned before, and that vendor would then run the, the um, background check and get your personal information um, before supplying you the um, ammunition. And as the slide says, it does not apply to non-California residents. So you have people from uh, other states who live there and want to visit you and go shooting, if they were to purchase ammunition outside the state of California, they most certainly would be able to do so, and then bring that ammunition with them into the state, and then use that ammunition to their heart's content and not be subject to uh, this restriction. However, if they then ran out of ammunition and wanted to purchase more in the great state of California, then at that point they will be most certainly subject to uh, the background check and their information, and they'll probably say snide comments to you about how awful California gun laws are um, in the process of doing that. Uh, nevertheless, there's all of that. Uh, again, exceptions to the import ban. Um, some of the exceptions I mentioned before um, rear their heads yet again. The one at the bottom is rather interesting, and again, it's very more specific than what I've watered down here, but nevertheless, licensed hunter and competitive shooters who purchase ammunition outside the state of California can bring it back, but they're pretty much limited to less than 50 rounds, and it needs to be the firearm that they used for either their competitive shooting event or their hunting. And so if you go out of state to do some uh, waterfowl shooting and you don't use up all the ammunition you purchased outside the state, and then you have some shotgun shells still left with you, you may bring those back into the state, but you don't want to exceed um, 50 rounds, and again, there are, these exceptions are very specific. Um, I would strongly advise you to confirm uh, that you meet all of the requirements for that exception before availing yourself of that exception, uh, but nevertheless, uh, keep that exception in mind. Uh, you license hunters and competitive shooters who want to purchase the ammunition outside the great state of California. And so all of these things I've been talking about before, and they don't nearly have as much, um, if Newsom passes, references as I remembered them doing, but nevertheless, all of that stuff I talked about before um, had to do if Newsom, the Newsom Initiative, Prop 63, does not pass. Um, what they did with this bill was, and I mentioned it already, say, okay, all of that stuff before becomes California law and will be California law um, as of January 1, 2017. However, if the Newsom Initiative passed, it passes, only certain sections of that law that passed in California, I'm sorry, up in Sacramento, will come into effect, and the rest of what I mentioned before will not apply because the Newsom Initiative or Prop 63 covers a lot of that stuff and, of course, does a whole bunch of other things uh, beyond just the ammo stuff. But since we're just talking about ammo here, I'm going to touch upon some of the ammunition 
um, requirements in the Newsom uh, initiative, and one of them being is that when you're going to purchase that ammunition and you need to provide your personal information, as I highlight there, um, it's not a necessarily a computer system that you need to avail yourself of because the vendor is going to need to take your information on a form and then no doubt submitting that information through the computer through to DOJ. But for purposes of this, it's going to be a form in addition to the computer information that needs to be acquired. And of course, you're going to need to sign off on that in order to be able to purchase the ammunition if the Newsom Initiative applies. Like I also mentioned before, um, when I was talking about the bill, uh, the information that you provide to DOJ will only be held for DOJ for two years under the bill. However, if Newsom passes, um, the time that DOJ will be able to keep the information concerning your purchase of the ammunition will be indefinite under those sections that will apply after or if the Newsom initiative gets through. And then on top of that, I mentioned before, if Newsom doesn't pass, this, the, the bill reads that the vendor will only be able to provide that information to law enforcement. However, if Newsom passes, um, the law will be different, and the vendor cannot sell, disclose, or share the information without your written consent. And so if they were able to give your written consent, they may be able to use your information for purposes of advertising or providing that information um, to their, I don't know, um, list of people they send out their monthly alerts to and things like that. But nevertheless, they can have you waive the confidentiality of that information and then use it um, later on. Um, also, um, there are a couple of uh, exceptions for purposes of the Newsom Initiative acquire or passing um, by way of background checks. Again, if you have a firearm in the automated firearm system and you're not prohibited, that will be one way for them to do a, a background check. On top of that, you'll have, be able to uh, meet the background check requirement with a certificate of eligibility, um, the single ammunition per transaction, and then at the time you purchase a firearm, that background check would apply to you for purposes of the ammunition background check. Uh, those uh, under Newsom would be additional ways for them to conduct a background check on you for purposes of that requirement. And in addition, um, those not subject to the background check requirements, again, somewhat the same. You get your vendors, um, which includes California Fire Licensed Firearm Dealers, Wholesalers, Gunsmiths, Centralized List Exempt. However, at the bottom of that, it's slightly different for sworn members of law enforcement because in order to be exempt from the background check requirement, if Newsom passes for law enforcement, they're going to need to get a letter from the head of their agency confirming that they're able to uh, acquire that ammunition um, and provide that to the vendor at the time of purchase. As I mentioned before, under the bill itself, um, the, I'm sorry, the sworn member of law enforcement just has to show proper identification, and that is, no, that is not specified in that law. But presumably that would just be able to show a law enforcement ID and you're done. However, if Newsom passes, um, our friends in law enforcement who want to purchase ammunition not be subject to this background check uh, requirement will need to show way more um, than what's required under the current law um, if Newsom passes and it's uh, those requirements listed at the bottom of the slide. Um, and again, um, if Newsom uh, uh, passes, you're still going to need to, um, I'm sorry, go through the electronically background check system. Again, that's through the automated firearm system, confirming that you um, are eligible and not in the armed prohibited person database, um, a person who doesn't have a, a firearm registered to them, and of course doesn't have one of those other exceptions I mentioned before, like a COE, or is purchasing ammunition at the same time of their firearm. Um, they will need to come up with some other way to um, do a background check on that, um, but nevertheless, it's not entirely clear what that process will be. The permit the, the, I'm sorry, the permit requirements process that is currently in Newsom, presumably under this bill, and if Newsom becomes law, will not be the requirement. Um, but that will remain to be seen if the lieutenant governor is satisfied with the requirements of this bill as it affects and changes his initiative. Um, 
And last but not least, for purposes of the Newsom initiative, a lot of the other foregoing stuff I mentioned before would become law and is mirrored um, with the current law as it was passed in SB 1235. Um, if there are still restrictions and requirements on um, importing ammunition by residents, access to ammunition by customers, face-to-face -face transactions. A number of the exceptions I mentioned before, and especially those for hunting clubs, um, would not apply if, if Newsom passes. There's a target range exception, um, but beyond that, a lot of the more broad exceptions that are currently in the bill uh, would go away because Newsom has a lot fewer exceptions to a number of those requirements and restrictions. And so if Newsom were to pass, a number of those exceptions I mentioned before um, would not be present and you wouldn't be able to, and you as a member of some of those clubs and those clubs themselves wouldn't be able to avail themselves of those um, exceptions in acquiring ammunition. Um, the fire licensed firearm dealers in the state of California will actually be automatically considered vendors under Newsom, um, but nevertheless, uh, vendors of ammunition would be required to be submit to a mandatory theft loss reporting. So uh, if a ammunition vendor under Newsom lost one round of ammunition out of a box, um, they would be required to report that um, to local law enforcement within a limited period of time. Again, that would be a requirement if Newsom's initiative does pass. Um, what are we hearing? What's going on? Um, like I said before, these are subject to change. Again, if Newsom passes, um, there are going to be slight modifications to what I've said before. And again, the California Department of Justice still will need to implement regulations relating to a lot of these requirements concerning the background checks um, and the vendor's licensing and the personal information gathering. And so we're not all the way done yet. And as I alluded to, as I was summing up the Newsom stuff, uh, the law, uh, the Senate Bill 1238 that I just mentioned before, changes the Newsom initiative if the Newsom initiative passes. And no one knows, as far as I'm aware, how the Lieutenant Governor feels about that. Um, and so there may very well be a conflict between the, the Lieutenant Governor and um, either California Department of Justice, or as it's been playing out in the media, between Lieutenant Governor and Senator De Leon on whose law is going to um, trump, <laughs> oddly enough, at the time of election. Um, but nevertheless, which law will take priority, Newsom's initiative, or the initiative as it's changed by Senator De Leon's bill. And we don't necessarily know how that's going to play out at the, with the courts or whether or not Newsom will choose to challenge that. Um, and so there's that potential as well. Um, last but not least, and to talk about when these things go into effect, again, the law will go on the books uh, one way or another um, on January 1st, 2017. And the question is going to be if the Newsom Initiative passes, there's only going to be a limited number of sections from that bill that becomes law on January 1st, 2017. Or if Newsom's Initiative fails, the vast majority of this, this conversation will go into and on the books January 1st, 2017. However, we will start seeing the rollout of these requirements in the, the upcoming years. Because as it says right there, um, vendors can start applying for and DOJ is required to start issuing license as of July 1, 2017. If you're going to be a vendor selling ammunition, you're going to need to have that license by January 1, 2018. And then when we're talking about the background check requirements, the personal information requirement, and the importation of the ammunition by a resident restriction, all of that stuff will go into effect, uh, I'm sorry, will be required or restricted on July 1st, 2019. And so there's still some time before all of this stuff starts slapping us, uh, slapping us upside the head. Um, but uh, there's that kind of coming down the pipes. And again, given the amount of time that they have in order to implement this stuff, it doesn't prevent the legislature from changing and doing whatever other shenanigans they want to do up in Sacramento in the meantime to potentially change or modify um, these requirements and these restrictions. 
Um, last but not least, you can find the, I'm sorry if I said 12.38 before, 12.35, um, uh, at the, the legislative website, but that's about it. And I hear rumbling in the background, so I assume Chuck's back. <laughs> yeah, Joe, let me, uh, let me people have, there's a couple of frequently asked questions that keep popping up here. Let me give you a second to think about the retired law enforcement officer and how he will or she will be affected and about rimfire. In the meantime, I want to answer a couple other questions. Uh, lawsuits. If uh, Donald Trump puts the justices that he has previously identified as his picks for Supreme Court on that court, there will be it will be there will be lots of lawsuits. There will be many lawsuits. Uh, there will be all kinds of Second Amendment challenges because we will have a Second Amendment that actually means something and has some teeth. If Hillary Clinton gets in, she will stack that court. There will be a lit litmus test for those Supreme Court justice appointments that they have to be against the Second Amendment and they have to be willing to read the Heller decision that was written by Justice Scalia in a way that Justice Scalia never intended. And unfortunately, that's the way that a lot of courts uh, are reading uh, the Heller decision, uh, not just in California, but across the country, most recently, unfortunately, in the Peruta case, which is on its way to the Supreme Court. But if we don't get the judges that, that cause us to win there, may not may not make it. Uh, but we're also looking at multiple legal challenges to the way these laws get implemented. Once a bill is passed, once a law is passed, it, ter it goes to the executive agencies to enforce. And the DOJ Firearms Bureau is way over its head. If you recall, I, I mentioned earlier that we, as part of our uh, job for NRA and CRPA, we watch that. They're way over their head. Their databases now have something like 40% error rates in, their, in the criminal records databases, in the um, registered firearms databases. I, I just simply, honestly, don't think they're going to be up to the task of putting together this type of an ammunition database. But uh, if they do, it will be you, you know, basically a, a database that gives you, uh, or gives them, gives the government uh, uh, information on the calibers of firearms that you possess. Not that they're limiting your purchase to a certain type of cal uh, caliber at this point, uh, but that's, that's what's in the information that will be in that database. Um, I do want people to know, folks are asking about importing ammunition. Um, and whether or not CHP will set up inspect or somebody will set up inspection stations. I everybody should know that right now, when you go to the Reno or, or one of the Arizona gun shows, there are California law enforcement agencies at those shows now. They look for cars in the, lo in the parking lot with California plates. They contact the DMV. They get the picture of the person to who that car is registered, the name and everything. And then they will go into the show and look for that person. And if they find that person buying magazines or anything else that's not allowed to be brought back into California, they will follow that car back into the state and pull you over on the way as you enter into the state of California. So that's being done now. Uh, people need to be very, very uh, much aware of that and careful at not just out-of-state gun shows, but in California there are undercover officers and confidential informants working those shows all the time trying to get people to participate in you know, uh, $200 for a Colt Python, no paperwork in the parking lot. Uh, if it sounds too good to be true, it's probably a sting. Um, some folks are asking, is, Noos is it better to vote for or against Newsom? Newsom is worse than this. This law is bad. The, the, the statute that was passed by Sacramento is bad. Newsom is worse. Uh, so we definitely do not want Newsom to go into effect uh, not, for multiple reasons, not just the ammo restrictions or the new ammo uh, uh, requirements that, he, that, that the Newsom Initiative, Prop 63, would put into effect. Um, uh, Joe, uh, I'll turn it over to you on retired law enforcement officers. Yeah, um, there are no exceptions <laughs> for retired law enforcement officers. Um, so at that point, uh, once you retire, you're not a current active uh, sworn member of law enforcement. Um, sorry, um, you're going to be subject to the requirements just like everybody else. Um, they didn't really build the exception uh, for law enforcement into this bill like they did, for instance, for the large capacity magazine one that we'll be talking about next week. Uh, but nevertheless, for purposes of this, uh, nothing. Uh, there is no additional exceptions for retired officers. Uh, Chuck mentioned, and I didn't see the question with respect to RIMFAR. I'm assuming it, it, it's a question that relates to the, both the definition of ammunition and whether or not rimfire ammunition would uh, be 
fall under the definition of ammunition for purposes of this bill? I would assume so, yes. Despite the fact that the, the definition is specific on the, the, the parts of the cartridge, cartridge and it does reference um, a, a case primer um, separately, and I believe there's a comma missing there, but nevertheless, I would assume that rimfire would fall under this restriction as well. Um, because I've never heard, and I haven't in the context of these bills, um, heard of any, and I jump back, um, uh, any um, restrictions or any limitations on that as it comes to rimfire. People asking about reloading, again, um, this, these bills have to do specifically with the sales, importation for California residents, and then the face-to-face -face transfer requirements of ammunition. The components themselves um, do not fall under that definition of ammunition that I just mentioned, um, nor does the sales of the individual components. And again, so projectiles, powder, case, uh, or, or cases um, would not fall under the restrictions for purposes of this. And then if you go about the process and you do enjoy reloading your ammunition, at least not yet, um, none of these restrictions would apply to it. There are additional other restrictions on, of course, um, can't be making your tracer ammunition in California, and you got to be very careful about the amounts of powder that you possess and, and what quantities you possess them in. Um, but for purposes of today's lecture and um, the discussions here today, uh, for most intents and purposes, unless, again, you're selling, um, you're giving, or you're reloading sometimes outside the state and bringing it into California, um, which is actually an interesting question, uh, but <laughs> nevertheless, um, that all would be, um, subject to this stuff, but uh, for most intensive purposes, the reloading um, is not going to fall under this stuff for today. Okay, so there's lots of questions still strolling by. We're going to leave that rolling for a while so you guys can get those in. Uh, uh, we can't answer them all right now, but I think we've gotten most of the, the frequently asked ones. Uh, I really want to thank everybody for joining the uh, webinar participating and for bearing with us as we got through all that stuff up front. Uh, we've got a lot of people who ask us what the CRPA and the NRA and the G Gun Owners of California do and uh, on the last webinar. So we're, we're learning. This is all, uh, you know, this is only the second webinar. We're, we're refining it as we go, and the next one we'll try and make it even more uh, concise and, uh, and answer uh, and anticipate and answer the questions that you guys uh, have been posing. So I really appreciate everybody participating, and we'll see you at the next one. Okay, and one last thing, those guys with questions after this is all over, you have the website there, contact at crpa.org. So for additional questions or questions as they go back to the follow-up and stuff, please address those questions at contact at, or to contact at crpa.org. The email address is there. Um, our office is getting a lot of questions still concerning uh, a lot of this stuff. Unfortunately, we can't address all of those, but we'll try to, through the CRPA, put those frequently asked ones together. And again, additional questions, um, of course, pre-ordering the book, or they will be in the fourth edition of the book uh, it, itself, um, in addition to the stuff we talked about last week. And of course, um, next week's lecture, which is same bat time, same bat ten channel, at least tentatively so, Wednesday at noon for the loaning, uh, the theft loss reporting, and um, large capacity magazine ban. Um, so I think and given the response that we're getting to these webinars, I just want to say again, if you have suggestions for webinars, uh, we'll be happy to put them together. This is a great way to communicate with gun owners, get them engaged, get them informed. Uh, and, uh, and NRA and CRPA and GOC are happy to provide this service. Uh, uh, there, there may be some time where it takes up so much time to put these together that we have to char start charging something for them. But for now, at least, uh, they're free. So uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. And do what you can to support those associations that are out there trying to fight for your right to keep and bear arms. And, uh, and we'll keep up the good fight. And uh, the, your involvement makes those groups stronger. We, they really, we cannot match Bloomberg's money. He made more in the last year than the NRA has made in donations since it was formed. Put that in perspective. Uh, but with, uh, with grassroots involvement, with uh, millions of gun owners in California engaged and, and letting their voices be heard, we, we will out, uh, uh, 
we will win over uh, over the the billionaires club that just uh, wants to buy the the election. So thanks again for your participation and stay informed and involved. Yep. And any further questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. We'll leave that open for the next five six minutes or so. Um, but both of us are signing off. Take care, everybody. Talk to you next week um, at noon on Wednesday.